I join with Brother Jonathan in welcoming each of you that are here. Those that are joining online by conference call, we're very happy to have you. And each one that's visiting, even some that are visiting, but uh, not really visitors, uh, we're happy to see all of you. It is summertime. Uh, that is the official, I guess, designation. And we'll have folks traveling here from other places. And some of you will be traveling other places. Just to take the Lord with you on vacation. We're happy that those of you that are traveling to be with us this morning have done just that. So um, welcome. And uh, we are so happy you are here. You know, they say in order to have a good country music song, you've got to have at least three. And if you can incorporate all three elements into the same song, you've done really well. You've got to have a truck got to have a dog and you've got to have you know a broken heart of some sort or type and if you can combine the truck and the dog and with a broken heart into one song then you've really got it made uh, I read a survey or just actually saw it and it kind of helped me prepare an introduction for this lesson what do you think is ranked as the number one saddest country music song of all time the saddest song now, some might automatically come to mind you think well you know there's some songs uh, blue eyes crying in the rain that sounds like a sad song, and indeed it is. Uh, you might think, um, going way back to the original Hank Williams number, I'm so lonesome, I could cry. Well, certainly, again, the idea of crying conveys sadness. But, according at least to the survey that I saw, the number one saddest country music song also happens to be the number one most played, uh, at least uh, I think Frank will agree with me, it was during my time in the business, the number one most played country music song at a funeral, written by Vince Gill. My boys know every word to it. Go rest high on that mountain. And uh, supposedly Mr. Gill wrote it in response, as I understand it, to the death of Keith Whitley. And uh, while you can debate the message of the songs, it applied to Mr. Whitley's life. That's another time and place to do that. But uh, that was at least listed in this particular survey of the saddest country music song. This morning, I invite you to take your Bible to Psalm 88, and I want to show you and study with you the saddest psalm, the most gloomy, discouraging psalm in Scripture. And maybe as a follow-up, you could ask the question, what happens when sing and be happy doesn't work? We have that song in our book, and the message is a good one. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. What do you do? According to the chorus, you sing and be happy, and that can take away your sorrows. But I know, and you know, that's not always the case. And it may be for you this morning, that's really not the case. And uh, I won't detail all, uh, because it's not about me, but uh, even some struggles that I myself am trying to work through uh, as of late. I've returned to this psalm many times, and... Um, not so that you can say that a boy or anything like that or pat me on the back when you leave, but about 2.30 this morning, I, I returned to this psalm. And um, I, I stayed with it for most of the rest of the time until the sun came up. And so um, if I fall asleep mid-sermon, you'll know what happened. And I really wish in some ways I could because sleep's one of those things that's escaped me as of late. But Psalm 88, the gloomiest psalm. Now, your Bible might have what we call a superscription. Just a little introductory set of statements that tell us something about the psalm. It said in my particular version, and this is not inspired, but these little uh, comments were added very early on. And so we have good reason to suspect uh, the guys that included them, probably uh, the Masoretic uh, translators as they're called. You don't have to remember any of that. They went on a good testimony for why they included what they did. So they called a song. A psalm of the sons of Korah to the chief musician set to, now look at this, Mahaloth Leonoth. Now, some of you musical people, if you know Hebrew better than I do, might be able uh, to help me with that. The best that I could do consulting the sources that I had available to me was that just simply basically means this is meant to be a sad song. You know, a sad song doesn't have a cheery uh, melody. I asked John specifically to lead songs this morning that were cheery, that were joyful, to set in contrast what we're going to read this morning because sometimes the melody and the sadness and the gloominess just goes right along with it. Now, we don't know the exact meaning, but that is the speculation that 
this psalm, as it was originally sung, would have been sung with that sad sort of melody. It's listed here as a contemplation, or your Bible might say a mascal. Again, that word is somewhat uncertain, but it seems to be just the reflections of this man, He-Man, the Ezraite. And He-Man is not the 1980s cartoon character of my childhood uh, that fought, you know, in the castle of Grayskull. And if you don't remember cartoons from the 1980s, just ignore that reference. But uh, He-Man was a strong guy. Well, in the Bible, there's a He-Man listed in 1 Kings 4.31 as a wise peer of King Solomon. And Solomon is said actually to excel him in wisdom, but he is one of the wise men of that day. Which is interesting if this be the same individual, because of what he suffered, maybe he gained some of that wisdom. I don't know if that's the case or not. However, uh, there is another individual who's listed as a he-man by name, who was a singer or a musician that was appointed by David to assist in various aspects of the worship of God in Jerusalem. And you can read about his life in 1 Kings 6, 15, 25, and then in 35. Really, uh, that's of no big, uh, you know, discussion, no big uh, significance what man it was. I'm just trying to set the stage a little bit for you about this particular psalm. One commentator, I think, said it best by way of summary. He said, quote, the words of this psalm, its words form a slow, unbroken cry of sorrow, the most tearful and saddest prayer to be found in literature. From beginning to end, it is a lament to God, interspersed with bewilderment as to why God has not already come to His rescue. There's our thought. What happens when singing Be Happy doesn't work? What happens when well-meaning people just pat us on the back and say, cheer up? What happens when it seems as if Heaven is silent. That's a really, really important question to ask. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you in advance, I'm not sure the psalmist finds a satisfactory answer. And I'm not sure you and I will find a satisfactory answer. But what I hope to show you as we read through and as we make some deductions, that there are still some things that we keep in mind, even when we turn to the saddest song in the Bible. Notice first there is an opening affirmation, which may be among, if not the most important part of the psalm, at least it's foundational to what will follow. I hope you have your Bible there. There's one in the pew in front of you, or look uh, there with your neighbor. Verse 1 and 2, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my cry come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. This psalmist knew and affirmed that God was the one who could save him and the only one who could. And that prayer was to be directed to him and to him alone. Even the song in our modern hymnals put it like this, Where could I go but to the Lord? And that's not to say we cannot utilize the assistance of other people when we're dealing with difficulties in life. We most certainly should. And some of us perhaps are too stubborn to not seek that help as early as we ought. And that's a flaw that many of us can confess in having. But ultimately, our help, as the psalmist will say elsewhere in this divine collection, our help comes from the Lord. May it never be the case that I believe it comes from anywhere else other than that place primarily. Now, we're going to look at some ways in which God offers that help, but it is ultimately from Him. And the psalmist affirms that. And he says, day and night, he has cried. And he asked that his prayer be heard in the ears of the God he loves. Number two, or in verses three to eight, he describes his desperate affliction. Again, keep reading with me and listen to the gloomy sorrow with which he pours out his uh, heart and our hearts with empathy feel for his when he says, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in low, in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You have afflicted me with all your waves. You have put away my acquaintances 
far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up and I cannot get out. It's hard to find anything in there that's positive. It's hard to see anything but the discouragement that is seeping out of this man as he bellows and as he perhaps through the sobs and through the choked back tears, maybe not even restricting their flow, asking God to take notice of how desperate his condition really was. He felt as if already dead. And perhaps given the state of his condition and the suffering he experienced, maybe longed even for that, given the problems that he encountered. He makes an urgent appeal to the Lord. My eye waste away, verse 9, keep reading please. My eye waste away because of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. That's kind of the transition. Just pause there at verse 15 and notice his urgent appeal. Lord, I want to be your servant. I, I want to have an answer. If I depart from this life, what good will I be to you then? What praise could I offer that would be heard? What example could I set so that others might know you and your faithfulness as it's been displayed in my life? But God, why do you cast off? Why do you hide? I've been afflicted. I'm ready to die for my youth. That's, that's my appeal. I'm ready for that. But Lord, is that really what you want? Is that really what you desire? Here's his acceptance in the closing verses. Again, by transition, verse 15, I have been afflicted, ready to die for my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me all together. Loved one and friend, you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. And so it ends. And it ends with this man offering no ray of hope. No, but with something better attached after that conjunction. <clears throat> but only the closing acceptance of, God, this must be what you desire. And this must be now what I must endure. So here's our lesson for the morning. What do we remember in the darkness? What do we remember when we come to the saddest psalm? In scripture and read it and try to make sense of what this man was feeling not just as an abstract academic exercise although that's beneficial and maybe that's the perspective from which some of you are coming at it this morning but more so when we ourselves are in the darkness because some no doubt are some no doubt many have been and yet as I've said before count yourself fortunate if you are among the lucky few, if we would call them that, who have yet to experience such a dark night of the soul, know that in all likelihood, unless the Lord returns first, you too will face what this man was facing in some form or fashion. And they are many and varied in which we encounter them in life. So what do we remember in the darkness? I think despite its negativity, this psalm, this sad psalm, does help us to remember these things. Number one, that we have fellowship with God in prayer. If you're at, in this class, at the Bible study hour, we study Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel is an amazing, both young man, middle-aged man, and by the time we reach chapter 9, an old man who has given his life to service to God in a foreign land, away from Jerusalem, away from his family, away from all that he held dear, even in exile, though he held fast to God. And now as he looks back on how God had treated his own people, he doesn't accuse God of wrongdoing. He said, God, we've got what we deserved. And he begs God by the great and awesome God that he is to help him. And there is one phrase that is so remarkable, and I'll read it again, even though some of you heard it last hour. 
In Daniel 9, verse 18 and 19, Daniel prays like this. Maybe this was the occasion when his enemies caught him praying and then threw him into the lion's den, the story that we all remember recorded in chapter 6. I'm not sure. That's just speculation. But here's his passion in prayer. Listen and ask yourself if this is how you pray. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For... We do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people who are called by your name. We have fellowship with God in prayer, not because of how good we are or what we have earned or deserve or merit, but because of how good he is. And he makes that available to us. And the psalmist, even in his sorrow, in Psalm 88, remembered that he had fellowship with God in prayer. I know, and let me say this as plainly as can be stated, even though some will no doubt misunderstand, sometimes we have to do more than pray. Now, people say, well, you know, if you just pray more, it'd fix whatever problem you're having. That's a terrible thing to say. I understand the basis from which it is said, but sometimes there is more that needs to be done than just prayer. But there must never be anything less done or we should not include prayer in what we do. And we must always start there, not as using prayer as a last resort, but as our first line of defense, our first line of coping, our first line of dealing with whatever darkness we may find ourselves in. He remembered the fellowship of God in prayer. Number two, even though, of course, he's writing in the Old Testament, this would not be applicable for him, but coming to the new and using the totality of Scripture, the benefit that we have, even in times of darkness, is that we have companionship with Jesus. Companionship with Jesus. The statement is made, and I'll leave it to your own further research, and I know uh, there is much that can be said that time will not permit us to explore this morning, but the very last verse in the Gospel of Matthew. Do you remember what it says? Jesus commanding His followers, the twelve, and by extension all of us, to go and to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, it's an interesting way uh, of translating that, echoing the Elizabethan English of the King James Version, the New King James Version says, Lo, but really it's just a transition. It's kind of the pause for a moment and don't let this escape your attention. Keep in mind, before we wrap up, Jesus' last words as Matthew records them in verse 20 of Matthew 28 is, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm with you. Now, we know that they would soon miss the physical presence of Jesus. He would ascend out of their presence. And they, no doubt, would leave them, leave them bewildered. Where are you, Jesus? But he said he was with us. And today, while there is no physical presence of our Lord with us, side by side, physical as I see you and you see me, uh, we still have the assurance and through his word, the instruction that he gives us that companionship with him. True fellowship with Him, if you want to use even a more beautiful word from 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Walking in the light, fellowship with the blood of Jesus Christ. My sins are washed away. The care and the love that He has for me does not waver, even though sometimes I'm tempted to think that it might. In the darkness, I need to remember companionship with Jesus. Number three, this kind of just builds on each one and maybe you'd say there's no point in making a fine line of distinction between them but I've done it this way nevertheless we need to remember the faithfulness of God the psalmist is praying not because he doubts God will do anything but because he knows God is the one who can do something do we really pray with that same sort of confidence today we pray again as I mentioned a moment ago sometimes merely as the last resort well, I've done everything else that I can do. Now let's see what God can do. Isn't that out of order? Shouldn't it be, God, what can you do? What would you have me to do? What is it that I can take from guidance that you give, that your word prescribes for me to take and incorporate into this situation? The faithfulness of God. In Hebrews 13, 
the Hebrew writer, facing hardship far beyond probably what any of us will, he said, why do I worry? Now, that's a good question, really, uh, for a lot of us, and me in particular. Uh, and the Bible answers that question repeatedly in a variety of passages. Uh, but the Hebrew writer says in chapter 13, he says, He himself has said, now this is Hebrews 13 verse 5, He himself is an emphatic statement from the original language coming into our English translations that says, don't miss this point. He himself, God himself, Jesus himself, uh, the creator and sustainer of the universe and everything therein has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Is it easy to forget that? Without question. It's easy, even when we remember it, not to let it have the impact that maybe it ought. The psalmist in Psalm 88, he's sad from start to finish. He's gloomy. He doesn't know what God's going to do. He even believes, as we noted as the psalm ends, that maybe God's not going to do anything. But even in that, God was faithful. And he's acknowledging, subtle as it may be, that even God's lack of attention or God's lack of acting, God's refusal to interject into the situation was still something that he was assured of, demonstrated his faithfulness and his care for him. Number four, remember in the darkness the support of other Christians. Again, this is something he didn't enjoy, but we do. We do. The support of our brothers and sisters. Folks, we need that more and more. I know because I have not availed myself of it to the measure that I should through the years. And um, there's one reason why, and it's P-R-I-D-E. You ever suffered from that? P-R-I-D-E. I have to be the strong one. I have to be the one that, you know, tells other people, here's how you should handle this. Here's the wisdom that I can dispense from Scripture. And I have harmed and hurt and uh, neglected the wonderful resource of Christian brothers and sisters too often through the years. That's my admission of sin and shortcoming in that area. So you forgive me of that, and I'm going to do better. And that means that I might ask you, I won't detail it for you, but uh, yesterday, for the first time in probably 40 years, I asked one of my good Christian brothers to talk with me, and he did. And it blessed my life in a way that I wish I would well taken advantage of, not just five or six years ago, but again, um, more than probably uh, 30 years ago, to be quite honest. But that's exactly what the Bible says to do, is it not? Galatians chapter 6, bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing that burden does have a responsibility. And I'll admit, standing here, I've often pointed the finger and said, you need to look, you need to see, you need to find, you need to uh, be proactive in that way. And certainly there's a need for that. But maybe pointing the finger back at myself and simultaneously again pointing to you, some of us, uh, we need to be more humble enough to say, I need help. Please help me. I'm struggling along the way. Will you come alongside? I'm not saying be the needy person. Don't be the squeaky wheel. Uh, we know that person. And we don't want to be that person. But trying to avoid having that sense of vulnerability should not negate the fact uh, that God never created us to go through life uh, always just flying solo. It's not what He wants. It's not what He made the church. He said the church is a body. And all of us well realize that just one part out of balance one part not performing as it should affects the whole. And how often, again, I'll just say it for my own benefit, you make application to your own life, how many times maybe my poor attitude and action and example in that area, my own unhealthiness in that way to receive the help that could have made me better and more effective in my service harm the whole body, I don't know. But I pray God's mercy and forgiveness and strength, wisdom to do better going forward. Here's the last point. Promises for the future. Is there any hope in Psalm 88? I looked for it. I promise I did. I looked for it there uh, this morning. And I've looked for it in the days before. 
And probably in all likelihood, I'll look for it in days ahead if the Lord permits those to come. And they're hard to find. And in fact, I'm not sure any hope is there in Psalm 88. But Scripture doesn't close in Psalm 88. The rest of God's Word unfolds beautifully to tell us about God's love seen in His Son Jesus, seen in what He did on my behalf, and what He did for you when He went and died in your place and mine on the cross and shed His blood for our sins. He promises in John 14 to go and even now be preparing a place. Now, I'll admit, the metaphysical uh, philosopher in me sometimes says, well, why does Jesus need to take time to prepare anything? Right? I mean, He's the same Jesus who, according to Colossians chapter 1, is the voice or is the word by which the heavens were made and the universe holds together. Genesis 1 confirms, God said, let there be light. There was light. So why does Jesus need to take any time now more than 2,000 years from when those words were spoken, round figures, more or less? Why have 2,000 years passed and He's still making preparation? I don't know why John 14, why Jesus said it in that way, other than simply to tell me that when the time is right, He said, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And when that time comes, no matter what had happened before it, and whatever I'd had to endure, whatever trial or trouble I'd been through, if I'm among those that not only know Jesus, but that Jesus knows me, and He takes me to be with Him where He is, all of this, Again, if we can reference a song, heaven will surely be worth it all. There is a curious little detail, and I'll kind of leave it at that uh, for you as we close. You may have a Bible, and some of our much older translations put it like this, and I couldn't really track down where it first appeared. But there are some English translations of the Bible that had, at the end of Psalm 88, at the end of verse uh, number 18 there, uh, the New King James says, My acquaintances in the darkness, period. But there are English translations that have some equivalent translation or rendering to that. But instead of a period, very curiously, you know what they put? A comma. Now, English teachers, correct me if I'm wrong, you probably will have to, but I know the difference. I think I remember enough from English class between a period and a comma. A period at the end of the sentence says the thought is complete. Whatever was uh, said, you know, that kind of puts an end to it. And you're just simply saying the statement is made and it's certain, you know, it, assuming that it's a true statement, but it's wrapped up. Nothing more to be added. Period. We sometimes even say that in our even public speaking to give us that visual image uh, as we talk. That's the way it is. Period. Meaning... No more questioning. But it's curious that there are some translators that said there's a comma there. Now, to be certain, just so you're fully informed, in Hebrew there were no periods and commas like that we use in the English language. So it's a moot point to say what was in it originally. Whoever the writer, he man here, he didn't use a comma or a period at all. He didn't use any punctuation like we do in the English language. But those who put a comma, what are they telling you? They're saying there's more. There's something else. This is not yet exhaustive. This isn't the final word. And so it's suggested that those that put a comma said their way of thinking was when this song was sung, after a period maybe of contemplation, maybe after a prayer like we do in our worship, maybe following up Psalm 88, Psalm 89 was sung. What does it say? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. And for more than 50 verses, 52 in fact, he will talk about what God has done. Now still, still, he's going to talk about God and how he deals with mankind. 
He'll still ask, for instance, in verse 46, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? We've asked that question. My time is short. What man can live and not see death? Verse 48, can one deliver his life from the power of the grave? And yet, verse 52, there is a finality. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. And that is the way the writer would be certain to tell you this is it. Still we bless the Lord. Amen and amen. Where are you this morning? I, I don't know. Maybe you're not in the darkness, the valley, the gloomy shadow. Maybe you're on a mountaintop. Uh, maybe it's sunny where you live. All is well. But whether or not you're on the top or on the bottom or somewhere in between in the shadow or uh, the sorrows, the joys or the happinesses of life, whatever it is, uh, consider Psalm 88. It's not been my purpose to discourage or to depress you. It's not been my purpose uh, to do that whatsoever, but it has been my purpose to show you that even in God's Word, even God's people, even those who were inspired by His Holy Spirit to record that which instructs us about Him, gives us information to show that sometimes in life there are sad days, there are tough days, there are hard times, there are great burdens to bear, there are troubles that weigh us down. And there are times even when it seems that God is paying no attention to us. But please recall in the darkness that God is there and that He loves us and that He cares for us. And it's because of the darkest day in history, that Friday when His Son died on the cross, that we can have the expectation of a day that passes all of our expectations in joy. Because the following first day of the week, His tomb was empty. Satan and man did their worst on Friday. God did His best on Sunday when His Son defeated death and overcame the grave. And if you have a relationship with His Son Jesus and are one of His followers, obedient to His will, then you have that same hope. And there's nothing else to substitute for it. There's no more important thing for any of us to consider this morning than whether or not we are living in the way that honors what Jesus did for us at the cross. This morning, if you're not a Christian, please let us help you in becoming one. The Bible says very plainly that the gift of God is His love and His salvation, His forgiveness through His Son, Jesus. But just as certain as it is a gift, it must be accessed and received by the terms that Jesus said it must be received. He's the one, after all, who is the gift giver. And His Word teaches us very plainly that if we hear and believe His Word, and repent of our sins confess our faith in Christ and are willing to die with Him in baptism, be immersed with Him in water, to reenact His death, burial, and resurrection, our sins will be washed away. What a wonderful blessing it is to know that so many of us have done that. And this morning, if you've yet to do that, we would encourage you to do just what the New Testament teaches in that regard so that you can have that same hope that we've spoken of at length this morning. If you've done that, if you're in a dark day, then tell us so we can help you. Ask for our support, and we'll try to help you in every way we can. Uh, some may be able to help more. Some may be able to help less. Uh, some may only be able to pat you on the back and say, I'm praying for you, but that'll help, won't it? Maybe that's what you need. Maybe that's the strength that you desire. Maybe there's sin that's put you in darkness, and you know that's why you're there, just as we talked about from Daniel chapter 9. Daniel knew why his people were suffering. He was so sad that he and his people had broken the heart of God by their refusal to live by God's holiness. If as a Christian, that's what you've done, and you know that sin needs to be removed and the guilt taken away, then the great love of your heavenly Father, according to 1 John 1 verse 9, is that if we confess our faults, he is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If any of these needs are yours, please make them known to us. Let us help you as we can and come while we stand and sing together.